Hi, I'm Dr. Piers, and before I get going today, I would like to give a big shout out to Zoe Baranaga, a uh, current AP Biology student of mine who composed and recorded the beautiful little piano riff that goes with my new graphic at the beginning of my video. So thank you very much, Zoe. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about control, uh, not that kind of control. I'm talking about the types of control that you need to put in place to set up a proper experiment. Specifically, I want to discuss the ideas of controlled variables and experimental controls. It's important to know the difference between these two, so I'm going to be chatting a little bit about what they are, as well as why we need them, giving some examples along the way to help us out. So let's deal with the controlled variables first. But before we can talk about those, we need to quickly define what the independent and dependent variables are. So when we set up a basic experiment, we're often asking a question like, what is the effect of X on Y? So for example, we, could, uh, we might ask, what is the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction of the enzyme catalase in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a single celled yeast? When the research question is paraphrased like this, X, or in this case, temperature, represents the independent variable, which is the variable that ex the experimenter has decided to manipulate or change. Meanwhile, Y, or in this case, the rate of reaction of catalase, is the dependent variable, which is the variable that the experimenter will measure or collect, and that will become the raw data of the experiment. We can set the experiment up by mixing yeast with sodium alginate, and then putting that dropwise into a solution of, of uh, calcium chloride. This results in the formation of little spheres that encapsulate the yeast. And when these spheres are then placed into a solution of hydrogen peroxide, they sink to the bottom. But as the catalase in the yeast reacts with the hydrogen peroxide, the oxygen that is released is retained in the spheres, making them rise to the top. So that's by the time, uh, the time it takes for the spheres to rise is a direct measure of the rate of reaction. So using different temperatures of hydrogen peroxide solution, that would allow us to actually answer the research question. But in order to run an experiment that just investigates temperature, we need to keep everything else constant from trial to trial. And that is where the controlled variables come in. Controlled variables can be defined as aspects or variables of the experimental setup that could affect the results, but ones that you don't want to affect the results, since that would invalidate any correlation between the independent and dependent variables. So you need to control them. So what might be some examples here? Well, first of all, you'd want to control the concentrations of both the yeast and the sodium algae so that you can make consistent uh, spheres. You need to control the volumes of the yeast and the sodium alginate that you use. You need to, um, to keep the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide the same. Uh, the volume of the hydrogen peroxide needs to be kept the same since you're measuring um, how fast the spheres rise in a particular volume. Um, the size of the spheres need to be as consistent as you can make them. The size of the vessel needs to be the same. And even the time for the spheres to equilibrate to a particular temperature um, needs to be in place before you start. So. These are just some of the examples that you might think about uh, in this particular experiment. When addressing controlled variables, the first thing you need to do is actually identify them for a particular experiment. And while all experiments are different, there's a few common things to think about, uh, such as, as we mentioned earlier, volumes, uh, concentrations of solutions, times which uh, the experiment might uh, go for, the temperature and other abiotic conditions that might affect the results, distances, if you're measuring light intensity, for example, uh, particular equipment that needs to stay the same over the course of an experiment, and even sometimes manipulations, whether or not you shake uh, the reaction um, for any length of time or at any particular interval. Now, not all of these are gonna apply, and of course, there would be others given the unique nature of all experiments, but it's a good place to start.
The second thing that you need to do is put a plan in place to actually control those variables, as it does little good to state in your procedure that you're going to actually control the temperature of the experiment and not bother actually outlining how you're going to do it. Once you have an experimental setup, it's time to ensure that you include the proper experimental controls. So what are those? Basically, they are tests that you set up alongside your investigation that ensure your conclusions will be valid. Different controls will address different facets of your experiment, but ultimately, I think they all fall under the big umbrella of answering your critics and addressing the skeptics. So let's get into some examples. You set up a plot of land to test if adding fertilizer to plants helps them grow. You plant the seeds, you regularly spray the plot with liquid fertilizer, and you find that the, plot, uh, the plants grow really quite well. So your rudimentary conclusion? The fertilizer works. But the skeptic will ask, how do you know the plants wouldn't have grown anyways? Hmm, the cat is right. So you set up the experiment again this time with a control group that you don't add fertilizer to. And sure enough, you see difference in the overall growth of the plants. So again you conclude, the fertilizer must be working. Yet the skeptic still exists. How do you know the growth isn't due to the water being added and not the fertilizer? Hmm, good point again. So you repeat it one more time, but this time you spray the test plot with fertilizer solution and the control plot with the same amount of water and examine the results. In other words, a proper control group is treated exactly the same as the experimental group, except for the absence of the independent variable. And that way, you can ensure that any differences seen between the two can be attributed exclusively to the independent variable, and the skeptic is satisfied. Another somewhat similar benefit of running controls can be seen in the following experiment. If you treat a water flea with a solution of adrenaline, its heartbeat can be clocked at about 75 beats per minute. If you try again with another water flea, but this time flood it with a solution of alcohol, the heartbeat is about 26 beats per minute. But it's not until you run a control with just water that you see and can state definitively that adrenaline increases the heart rate and alcohol decreases it. So controls provide us with a baseline value to which we can compare multiple changes of the independent variable. There are a few more reasons why you should consider running proper experimental controls, and this can be shown uh, on, on this experiment. So let's say you investigate whether or not apples have the enzyme catalase by dropping a piece of apple into some hydrogen peroxide containing a drop of detergent, and that's so that any bubbles produced are retained as, as foam. And you see a tiny bit of bubbling after a few minutes. Conclusion? Apples must have some catalase. Correct? Not so fast, the skeptic purrs. How do you know that wasn't from dropping a solid object into the solution. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch, but you need to deal with it. So you repeat the experiment with a glass bead and find no bubbles. This is called a negative control since it's designed to produce no result. And this is used to demonstrate that the experimental result of, of, in this case of a few little bubbles, is due solely to the change in the independent variable. So really, we have already seen this type of control in the fertilizer example earlier. But what if the apple piece produced no bubbles at all? Can we conclude that the apple has no catalase? Well, by now you should see the skeptic coming and be ready for his questions. How do you know that the hydrogen peroxide is actually working? Well, you can put his mind at ease by setting up another test where you add a solution of catalase enzyme to the mixture. If it bubbles, then you know that the hydrogen peroxide is just fine. And this is called a positive control since it's designed to produce a known response, in this case the production of bubbles in a hydrogen peroxide solution. This is used to validate the experimental procedure, often by demonstrating that all the components of a particular experiment are working properly. I could go on and on with examples, but since each experiment is unique, the best thing to do is take these basics and prepare yourself for the skeptics. And I hope this gives you a good starting point and leads you to the 
good kind of control as you go forth with your experimentation. Thanks for watching.